celebrating his birthday today under all that smoke and I just think it's worth keeping all these things in uh, the forefront of our prayer pockets this week. Amen? I'd like to talk to you for just a few moments, um, and I really mean that, uh, on the purpose and power of blind faith. Uh, the reason that God requires it and what it will do in your life to accept that requirement, step up to the plate, the purpose and power of blind faith. Thank you guys for the anointed uh, music ministry this morning. Uh, it's not easy to come week after week after week and just be in the flow, be in the vein, be in the pocket, be instant in season and out. And I'm just loving working with this music department is incredible. And so uh, I see Deb Debbie Hill is saying that there's Colorado fires up north of Grand Junction, which is where I was born, and many of Sister Hill's children that I grew up with, um, and they, she said they're seeing the haze in New Mexico from the fires in Colorado. So y'all, it's just, let's pray. <laughs> let's just pray. So all through this week, but Father, just watch over your people, and and we want to know what you're doing and what you're saying, and, and we will even receive discipline. If that's what you're sending, we want to receive it. I know many things, I believe, have been disciplined, but we also want to get the message quickly so that it can just, you know, we can get out of the woodshed in Jesus' name. So just keep these things in your prayers. I think it's it's important. Um, and thank you for letting us know about that. The purpose and power of blind faith. In uh, the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter and the 29th verse, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? So because you have seen me, is that why you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Somebody tell me who he's talking to right there. Hey, you've been to Sunday school. Holler it out. Who's he talking to right there? There you go. I, I'm sure somebody had said it first, but you said it loud enough I heard it. Thomas. What do we call Thomas? See, everyone knows that. It's the most unfair thing. We, it, we, we have really built a persona around Thomas based on his weakest moment. He's not even the guy that denied Jesus three times. He's just the guy that was having trouble realizing he really was resurrected. And he, he just couldn't get himself to believe the reports. And so he had to touch him. He had to see him. He had to lay eyes on him. Then he had to touch him and feel that it wasn't makeup, that those really were holes. He just had to be sure. Remember, he saw him dead. He saw him brutalized beyond the point of recognition as a human being, the prophet said and then dead, and then buried. And then three days later, you're going to tell him he's alive, he's risen. They didn't have the benefit. We, we look at the law and the prophets now, and we see Jesus all over that. We see the gospel all over that. We, we see in all the Old Testament characters, types of Christ, and his death, his burial, his resurrection, and all over the Torah. They didn't necessarily see all that in one piece because we have the benefit of 2,000 years of people going, oh yeah, that's how what he did aligned with. And we have the whole New Testament to explain it all, which the, the New Testament, it, it became canonized as scripture because it was God-breathed. But the, the intent of the writers when they were writing it, I don't know whether or not they knew that they were writing scripture. It would appear sometimes they knew but it was really commentary on the Torah. That's why 
when people focus on the New Testament rather than the First Testament, that's really missing the point. The, the, the New Testament is here to help you understand the law and the prophets. And so um, Thomas didn't have all that benefit. And not only that, but many people don't know this, but Thomas wound up taking the gospel to India. And um, he founded churches that are still in existence today in India. And just like the Roman Catholic Church traces its founding, it got off track at a point, but it traces its founding back to Peter. And, and the Maronite Catholic Church across the way from us here, they trace their lineage back to James. All these are historical realities. These churches grew out of the churches those apostles planted. And in India, their ancient churches come from Thomas. And not only that, but uh, in around the 1200s, I believe, they went through the kind of reformation that we had in the Western churches about 500 years ago. And so there are Bible-believing, gospel-believing, full gospel, Holy Ghost-filled churches all over India that came out of this, this awakening, this revival they had a long time before we had it in the West. Those are the churches that Thomas planted. He's not doubting Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas because one time he doubted. I would hate to be defined that way. And so I, I'd like to suggest that we give Brother Thomas a break. He did a lot for the kingdom. But he had a moment right there where what God was doing so far exceeded his capacity to understand the world around him and the laws of how things work that he just struggled for a minute to really get it. And I think that that happens to me three times before I've finished my morning coffee. I see things happening in the world around me. I relate them to the experiences that I have. I understand them a certain way. I slot them a certain way. And I move on, and probably 99% of the time, I am completely unaware of the divine drama playing out through them because I've, I've already decided what the borders of my reality are. I've already decided what my filter for existence is. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, number one, I die daily. Have to go take that self back to Calvary and, and put it back on the cross with Jesus, put it back under the blood, say, get out of my way, flesh and try to be disrobed of your, your own ways a little bit more. And that is why he said that we are renewed in the spirit of our minds daily. So in the very existence of your persona, you need a renewing every day in the center of your self-awareness. Because y'all... Every single day of our lives, it is the will of God that we wake up a little closer to His image, that we become just a little more reflective of His glory, that we see things a little bit more like He sees them, that a little bit less of us is evident to the world around us and more of Him is apparent upon us. And I, I sat with with a, a brother in this church a couple of weeks ago uh, in Estancia, and we talked about the wounds that we carry, some of them from the world around us, some of them from church, some of them from family, some of them from our own doing, some of them from traumas that have been inflicted upon us, and, and we carry all this woundedness and all these scars, and, and we may look around us, many of us will look around us and think, if they knew how messed up I am, it would freak them out. They wouldn't be able to handle me. They wouldn't, they wouldn't want to associate with me. 
They're saying that Calvary is for me. They're saying the blood is for me, but I think I might have trampled the blood. I think I might have offended the Holy Ghost. I think I might have blasphemed and I might not be even able. There are people in this room who struggle with those thoughts sometimes. There just are. And I want to tell you something. If you're ever that far gone, you won't know it because you will not care. If there's something in you that gives you a pang of desire when you hear the gospel, if there's anything left in you that wants to go home, if there's ever a time when a song from Sunday school goes through your mind and you miss how it felt to be innocent and to be young and to be free of all of this mess, then you have not gone beyond the grip of his grace. If you hear him calling, then he is calling for you. If you still want him to want you, then he wants you, and it's not over. And I don't know why I'm saying that. But there's somebody, maybe in this room, maybe on the feed, but you need to know that. Before you lay your head on your pillow tonight, you need to know that if you're not right with Jesus, it's not because he won't have you. It's because you're not done with your prodigal ways yet. And you may look around you and say, I, I, I want to be done, but I don't know how I can be done. Well, I'm hooked on it. I'm a slave to it. I can't get away from it. It's not that I don't want to. The Apostle Paul himself said, every day I'm frustrated and angry because the things I hate, I do. And the things I love, I can't do. And I see this, this law of sin and death at work in my members. And I wonder, am I even saved? Because I thought that Jesus washed that away. And so I look around me and I say, how can I be at once a free man and a slave to sin? And the answer is, as believers, we are saved we are being saved and we will be saved. We are always in that. We are saved when we come to him. We are being saved as we live for him and we will be saved when we see him because it does not yet appear what we shall be like, but we shall be like him when we see him face to face. But in the meantime, you get the full benefit of Calvary, not some of it. When you look around you, church folks, at people that aren't acting right, like when they come into church, let's just use a little Sunday school example because we got the kids here, so we'll keep it real PG. When they come into church and they smell like cigarette smoke and then you see them praising and there's a little voice in you that goes, I don't know about that, man. I'm going to be shouting like that if I was addicted. That ain't right. I heard what you said the other day. My mama used to wash my mouth out for using that. You better watch out for that. You better watch out for that. I'm not saying that we don't want to be made more like him and that we don't need to be made more like him. We absolutely do. If today you are not closer to reflecting his image than you were yesterday, then you need to get on your knees and repent and get back in the process. But what I'm telling you, all of us religious folk need to watch out for is that the blood says they are fully saved, sanctified, because when he sees them through the blood, see, we were taught, well, you're saved by Calvary, but you're not sanctified by, you're sanctified by your walk. Well, I got a real problem with that because the Bible says that nothing unclean can ascend his holy hill. So if you're going to tell me that you're saved when you come to Jesus, but you're not sanctified until you look sanctified and you sound sanctified, we got a real problem because if you go to eternity anywhere in there, if I go today, for instance, 
I won't be sanctified enough to ascend his holy hill. So it's all or nothing. Either when you get the blood and the name on top of you, either you are clean, pure, sanctified, holy in his eyes, and it exists in heaven and it is being revealed on earth, or it's nothing. The blood is not enough. The word is not enough. The name is not enough. It's all or nothing. And so my Bible tells me that the prosecuting attorney is in the presence of God both day and night, the accuser of the brethren, and he's running down the list of everything you ever did, everything you ever thought, everything you ever said, every selfish impulse, every carnal desire, every time you clicked on a link you had no business clinking on, and, and he's just talking about it, talking about it, and, 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 and I would want to be real careful with that because when my uh, evaluation of my fellow believers lines up with the adversary's evaluation, I just might wind up in the way of the grace that's covering them and I will get knocked down real fast because when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord lifts up a standard against it. So he says, I want to tell you about Shules. I want to tell you about Asbel. I want to tell you about John and and. and and the, and the Jesus, the lamb with the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet, he stands up and he says, excuse me, but that's my client you're talking about. And he is innocent. He, and I will prove it today. And then it shows his scars. So you don't want to get on the wrong side of that. Because the people around you you may see all kinds of mess in their life. The problem is you're not looking through the blood. You're not looking through the blood. It's called rightly judging or discerning the body. It's what we do in communion. It's what next week is about. It's what baptism is about. Baptism is not because you've got it all right. Baptism is because you've got it all wrong. It's your public pronouncement. I need a Savior. I need to be, have my life hid with His identity because mine won't get me where I want to go. And so if you're new here and you haven't been baptized, let me encourage you not to let it go further than next week. Because you've got no reason if you believe and trust in him fully. If you repent of your sins and selfish ways and desires, there is literally nothing that could possibly disqualify you from being hid with Christ and raised to new life at baptism. Doubting Thomas, probably the worst misnomer we use. Thomas is a giant of the faith, a giant, a legend, a martyr. Two of on, I mean, he, he's one of only 12 that left everything and followed, and one of only 11 who stayed faithful out of everybody. He took a massive leap of faith to believe the resurrection and he was blessed for it, but he missed the blessing. We do that all the time. We miss the best that God has for us because we are too busy evaluating to receive. I think my least favorite phrase is I call it like I see it. I get why people use it. I've used it. I don't like it. What do you mean you call it like you see it? We serve a God who calls those things which are not as though they already were. Not as though they will be, as though they already were. This is what I just said to you about folk you don't think are sanctified enough. You and the devil say they aren't. God says, I call things that are not as though they already were. God says, I call them sanctified. What do you have to say about that? 
That's why 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says we walk by faith, not by sight. And what the context of that that we rarely refer to is he's talking about being dead or alive. He, he said when we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. And when we're at home with the Lord, we're away from the body. And so we who walk by faith and not by sight would rather be absent from the body. Because we haven't seen him, but we believe him. Thomas, like so many of us this morning, had to touch him. Had to feel his presence. Had to see measurable proof of his power before he could worship. One of the fundamental flaws built into the Pentecostal expression of worship is that we can go, we can sit like a bump on a pickle all through church and go home and say, I just didn't feel much today. It just wasn't very anointed. The music wasn't really on. The speakers were too loud. The preacher was whatever. And we can go home and just say, ah, you know, we'll try again next week, see how it feels. But you had an opportunity to worship. You had an opportunity to worship. There was as much for you as you wanted to get. Today I got so caught up at the beginning of service and just thinking about all the pieces because we're doing so many different things and, and I'm almost done here because I, I want us to be able to move on to the party. And we're doing so many things, and, and I got so caught up in it, and we're in the middle of a very powerful song, and, uh, you know, band is going, and, but I'm thinking about all these different things, and all of a sudden I feel a wind on my ear, and Sister Schoonmaker just went by like a... Like a something out of somewhere. And I turned around... After she ran around back, and I, I just glanced back, and she was back in the corner just getting the biggest blessing, just drenched in the Spirit. There's as much for you as you want at any given time. I was caught up in the business of the service. I was Martha-ing. I was doing the business of, and that's the danger of ministry. We get caught up in the doing. And we forget to be in Christ. And it was such a great reminder for me, an illustration this morning, that we so easily miss out on the best that God has for us because we get caught up in evaluating and thinking and, and running things and the Lord's looking for believers who can suspend disbelief for long enough to take a leap of obedience based on blind faith and watch him prove himself after the fact. It's the divine prerogative. It's frustrating, but it's God's prerogative to do it this way, and he does. He will only prove himself to people who believe. They said to Jesus... Come down off the cross if you're, if you're the Savior. If you are who you say you are, come off the cross. And he said, listen, I, I could have five legions. I could have, I could have thousands of angels here right now. And they would do all the work. I wouldn't even have to do the work. But he didn't. He proved himself to a couple of ladies who went to the tomb to worship him when the world said he was dead. When their minds said he was dead. But I just somehow I've got to go pour some fragrance on him. I've got to go minister to his body. What if we could learn to be like Mary, even if it seems like it's all dead and lost. I'm just going to worship. I'm just going to minister to his body. I'm just going to believe him. She got to see the empty tomb before anybody else did. 
God receives the greatest glory when we trust and obey before we see his hand in our lives, before we feel his touch, before we observe his power. I know it's a simple message. We're gearing up for Baptism Sunday, and I wanted to spend a little while this week, and it might spill over into next week, just reminding us of the basics, the principles that have brought us all here. Paul said, I I see this curse, this law of sin and death at work in my members. It frustrates me. I want to do things that I don't do, and I hate to do things that I do. But thanks be to God. In Christ Jesus. That's everything. The purpose of God calling us to blind faith is to produce perfect obedience in us so that we can experience His power to change the very reality we exist in. See, I've taught my kids over time when we call their name, when we say to do something, and we're still working on it, particularly with one of them. But you have to keep going back to it. That took too long. Your reaction was too slow. When I call your name, you answer, and you start moving towards me. When I tell you something to do, you better be doing it before you realize you quit doing what you were doing. Is that because I'm a tyrant? Is that because she's a tyrant? No. I've I've told them so many times, it's because if there was ever a danger behind you that you didn't see, or you were standing in a road and didn't realize it, and there's a car backing up, or or there's there's a, a person that I don't trust walking near you, if I say your name, I need to know you will be in my presence quicker than a blink of an eye because I'm your father because we're your parents because we have your good at heart so you I, you you no I won't explain myself to you I might explain myself to you later after you obey but I will not explain myself to you before you obey because there may come a day when the danger is so immediate That if I have to explain myself to you to get you where I need you to be, it will be over by the time you understand. I grew up reading Laura Ingalls Wilder. And there's a story in one of those books where they went to the I think Pa was out of town, and Ma and Laura went to the barn to milk the cows, and it was dark. And in those days, it would have been quite dark. And they got to the stall, and the cow was already in the stall, but it was kind of leaned up on the side where it would be hard to milk it. And Laura shoved on it, and Ma shoved on it, and it didn't really move, just kind of grunted. And Laura started, you know, punching, kicking, whatever she was doing, trying to get the cow to move. And Ma said, Laura, go inside the house. And she said something froze in her. She felt the gravity of the moment. And she ran for the house. And when Ma came in, she said, It's a good thing you picked tonight to obey because that wasn't a cow, that was a bear. God does not have to explain himself to us in order for him to reveal himself to us. He just needs our blind faith and our best effort at perfect obedience. If I understand what you want from me, I'll do it. And if I don't understand, I'm going to keep asking and seeking until I get there. 
Psalm 107, he changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. If the Holy Ghost doesn't change something on me this week, then that's where we'll begin next week, right where we're leaving off today. I just want to leave you with this brief thought about that passage. God's presence changes everything. When we walk with Him, that's obedience. What did Jesus say to everyone He called? Follow me. Quit what you're doing. Leave what you have. Follow me. That's it. No explanation. No further information. Same thing God did to Abraham. Just put it down. Follow me. When we walk with him in obedience, we live above the limitations of this mortal coil. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I saw so many of you kids worshiping your hearts out today. I mean worshiping your hearts out. I saw it all over the building. I want you to keep doing that. Do it, do it, do it all the time. Do it every day. Make a playlist of worship music and get with God every day. Listen to it. Pray about it. Pray with it. Ask God to reveal himself to you. Ask Jesus to become real in your life. Ask him to be your Lord. Ask him to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Even if you don't know what it is, just believe me. Ask him to do it for you. I want you. I want every one of you. I want every one of you online. I want you to know that the purpose of blind faith is to produce obedience in us so that we can walk in his presence and that changes everything. Then your evaluations are immaterial because he changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. Don't worry about your situation. Don't worry about your surroundings. Don't worry about your record. Don't worry about your rap sheet. Don't worry about what your reputation is. Just leave it all and follow him. Leave it all and come to follow. He's the best. He's the best thing that ever happened. He's king of kings and he's lord of lords. He owns everything you could ever desire. He loves you. He wants you. He's not giving.